tonight we welcome two individuals who have contributed greatly to the improvement of arts and culture, both locally and nationally, um, Kathy Copley-Berry and Dennis Berry. Um, given their visibility in the community, I feel it's a bit ironic to do an introduction. Um, I also mentioned to them both that if I were just to read their CVs, um, we would be here for an hour, and then I could turn the podium over to them. <laughs> so um, just to highlight a few points that will underscore why we just were so absolutely thrilled that they contribute to our series on the museum. I'll just start with Kathy. Kathy Cocaberry has worked at the Cleveland Museum of Art for nearly 15 years, and then in 1985, she helped to co-found and then served as executive director of the um, Cleveland Public Art. She has served as the president on the board of Spaces and is now the chairman of the Cleveland Arts Prize. And she and her husband, Dennis, were principals at Mount Wright and in this capacity helped to create the International Spy Museum in D.C. and the Malt Museum here in Beechwood. Um, they also formed their own independent company, Berry Projects, Am I giving it all away? <laughs> yeah, no, you're good. <laughs> um, and uh, Dennis uh, was the Midwest Director of the Archives of American Art at the Smithsonian and then Director of the Cincinnati Contemporary Arts Center from 1983 to 1991. He then turned his attention to rock and roll, and from 93 to 98, he was the Executive Director of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which he also helped to create. And as I mentioned, he joined Malwright Company and the very consultants has worked on such projects as the Seattle Experience Music Project. Um, he's now with Westlake, Reed, and Laskowski, Laskowski um, um, with a, an architectural engineering firm working on cultural arts projects and exhibition design. Um, in short, Kathy and Dennis have rightly been called leaders of transformational change in the museum field. Tonight they'll speak of new museums and new ideas. Please join me in welcoming Kathy Kultriberry and Dennis Ray. Uh, we decided to be a little provocative because we've been on the road giving a few talks and the last one we gave Dennis and I spoke separately and it really went well. <laughs> so uh, here we go. <laughs> I don't know how this is going to work because we're both ham so bear with us. Well. What we want to talk about today really is the view from the trenches. And the trenches have gotten a little deeper lately, too, in the museum world, probably in most parts of the world. But what we, are, what we do is really as practitioners. We are not here to talk about the philosophy or theories of museums. We're, we're here to talk about what we've learned doing them, um, the successes and the failures. You learn from the failures more than the successes, perhaps. Uh, some great opportunities. We've had some attitudes that were a, a really prevalent when we started that perhaps are not so prevalent today and that we're going to have some fun with. We love museums and that's why we care. Yeah. As Kathy said, uh, we're practitioners and we're not purists as well. Uh, we both grew up in the art museum world, Kathy at the Cleveland Museum of Art and, and myself at the Smithsonian. And those are interesting and wonderful worlds and we love them. But the museums that we do today are, are provocative and sometimes risky and sometimes dangerous and always controversial. And so, but I think they have lessons for what we're doing for all of us. Here we are in the trenches. So just when things were going along so beautifully and museum attendance was at an all time high and uh, it could be demonstrated that that uh, people spent more on the arts and cultures and going to museums than even sports. Kapoom, the economy hits, the asteroid hits the planet, and here we are. So what we wanted to do was to look at some uh, risky ideas, some funny things, and uh, some prevailing uh, thoughts. So we have borrowed a little from David Letterman who is the museum guru of museum gurus. And we'd like to do our top 10 <laughs> reasons why museums are in trouble. First, it's their IT staff. <laughs> and, let's, and let's go from there. So number 10. Without much ado. With no, without much ado, number 10. We exist for the artifacts. The artifacts are all. It's so nice and dark in here with our artifacts, and it's quiet. If you don't want quiet reverence, go to a Cavs game. Number nine. Visitors 
must be tolerated. And we are open to the public at least two days a week. Uh, we want to make sure that the staff days are extremely, the hours are convenient to staff. I would just add that as a Cleveland Museum of Art staffer way back when, our favorite day was Monday. <laughs> All the rest of the days, those miserable visitors came in. <laughs> that has changed. <laughs> Number eight. More interpretation? OK, we'll do longer labels, and we'll do smaller print. But we hate how those look, so we'll put them down, around, and back, or as close to the floor as humanly possible. <laughs> Number seven. We know our visitors. They are just like us. Number six. Early Byzantine pot shards from the J. Beresford Tipton collection, never before seen in this country. They will be beating down the doors. <laughs> <laughs> Number five. Both my grandfather and his grandfather were on this board, too. Num Damn it. <laughs> Number four. <laughs> we're not Disney. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Number three. If we build it, they will come. Number two because we're not for profit. We're not supposed to make money. And the all time number one reason why museums are in trouble. <laughs> We've always done it this way. So we see ourselves in some of this. We see some places we love in some of this. And happily, we don't see too much uh, still existing this way. So here's our white flag of surrender. <laughs> you can all surrender right now, you museum people, which we love. <laughs> You know, when we were asked to do this several months ago, the world was an easier place, as Kathy just said. And in the time that we had been preparing for this talk, months and months and months, <laughs> we, some of the uh, following things have happened. The Indianapolis Museum cut costs 10% and laid off 16 people. The Detroit Institute of Art has laid off staff and will close more days and doesn't know whether it will stay open. Closer to home, the Natural History Museum laid off 16, and the Akron Art Museum has also laid off people. Uh, LA MOCA, here's a great example. They've gone through their endowment, laid off staff, almost had to close, and uh, have been bailed out by Eli Broad. Uh, their director found a new job. Uh, museum, which cost $430 million to build, okay, and opened last year, has already laid off 20 staff and is laying off more. Brandeis University announced that it plans to close the Rose Museum and sell off the collection. The Sports Museum of America, and you probably didn't even know there was one, <laughs> the Sports Museum of America, built for $93 million on Wall Street, closed last week. After and, how long? Since May. I know, because I worked on it. <laughs> um, and the Las Vegas Museum of Art cut its staff and finally decided to close the museum. These have all happened within a short span of months. So the challenges that museums faced over the last many years have now been amplified. So we say, with all these situations, even before the current situation, why in the world wouldn't museums look at different models? And why is there a reluctance in some places to look at some new models, some risky models, and to do experimentation? What have you got to lose? And perhaps now you have less to lose. Ah, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I bring up the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame because it, A, brought me back to Cleveland, a city I love. But more than that, it is for me, um, it was a museum that broke new ground. Now, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, uh, I, it was, I use it because it's sort of our inspiration. It did so many things right. It did some things wrong. But it really met a challenge. It met a challenge because when we built the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, it overcame the challenge of doing a, music about mu a museum about music. Nobody said you could do it. Why would you want to do it? Uh, and it used music and performance as key to the way it presented things. Again, something that museums hadn't done in the past. An extensive use of electronic media. Think about it. Rock and Roll opened in 1995. Yes, museums occasionally had films, occasionally had those terrible little films that introduced exhibitions, but rock really turned to the power of film as a way of expressing things. Cutting edge access to the music, and as I said, great films with daring directors who actually kind of expressed the feeling and attitudes of the subject matter. So rock took on a real challenge. It, it, it was cutting edge with its uh, interactives at the time. I remember. I'll tell one little interactive story since we're all into interactivity. When we were doing Rock, the Rock Hall, we were asked by one of its uh, 
uh, board, board of Trustees members, Jan Wenner, to do the 10,000 songs that shaped rock and roll. Well, in 1995, it took us a year to do the 500 songs that could do the shape rock and roll because the technology wasn't there. But for us and for museums, it was an incredible advance. And it had its successes. Uh, it consistently, it's drawn 400 to 500,000 visitors a year, which is good for a museum. And uh, it's 92% of its visitors come from outside the Cleveland area, which is wonderful for our city. Next, please. And just some images rock if you haven't been there. I bet some of you have never stepped in the door. <laughs> but actually, it's a wonderful place. We're quite proud of it. And you should look at it for uh, all of its advances. And now, 15 years later, it needs to be upgraded. But some of the things you see there were really quite remarkable at the time. OK. It's interesting that rock was wonderful. And what it did for Kathy and myself and a number of the people that we've worked with was it was sort of our inspiration where museums could go. Uh, again, we loved the old model museums, but we knew that those models were in trouble. And we began to look at how you could take the rock idea, how you could take the advances in technology, the advances in AV, storytelling, uh, great subject matter, provocative subject matter, and turn it into something that would work for museums. And what we're going to show you here is a list of things we came up with in our new approach or our new formula. And not all these things are going to work for all of you who are in the museum world. But for what we wanted to do, this was critical to our thinking. First of all, location. When we, we set out to build some new museums, the one you are probably aware of is the International Spy Museum, which we'll talk about. But we looked at multiple other museum concepts, the idea of a new museum that would get a great location in the heart of a city, in a neighborhood, in an urban neighborhood, in an area that would draw a neighborhood that had tourists, and locals. Uh, again, the tourist draw was a kind of critical. So some of the cities we chose were big tourist cities, which is not always the case for all, for all museums in all cities. A sub smart subject matter. Uh, again, when we were looking to build or create a new museum, we looked at the subjects that hadn't been touched, like rock and roll hadn't been touched before in any significant way, except at the Hard Rock Cafe. We looked at a dozen subjects, some of which I can't even talk about today because we'd still like to do them. <laughs> and they're pretty good ideas. And a couple of those fell flat. But eventually, we came up with the idea of spying, because no one had done a spying museum that you could see. There are actually two very good spy museums. One's at the CIA, and you have to be a member of the CIA. And the other's at the KGB, and you don't want to go see it, even if you are a member of the KGB. Uh, so it was a, a spy became a subject matter that was fresh, never been done. Credibility and authenticity. We're a strong believer for, as, for museums being just that. We don't believe in schlock. Even with ideas that are provocative or different, non-art museums, non-traditional museums, you've got to have a research, credible experts, uh, uh, and authenticity in your topic and your subject matter and in your artifacts. Immersive experience. And I think this is critical for museums today. You're in a world where you're filled with immersive experiences, and that's when you can learn from Disney and all the others. Because maybe that doesn't work per per perhaps for a type of art museum, but for science museums, history museums, you name it. The idea of putting the individual in place is rather critical. Guest treatment, this is critical as well. The indifference of museums is legendary. <laughs> and we've all tried. I know we try. But sometimes it's the guard who's asleep. Sometimes it's the person at the desk who can't look up, uh, or the person who can't answer anything. Or as Kathy put in the slides, you know, we're only open two days a week. And <laughs> please, we've got to get out of here by 4.30, because I have to get home by 5. The sense of guest treatment is really incredible. And then viewing the museum as a transformative place. I think that's easy for all of us in this room. We do think of museums as transformative. But maybe we don't realize how magical they are. They really are magical and wonderful places. And the world does see them that way. Sometimes they see them with fear and trepidation. But they also know that a museum experience can be something so special and different. Next, please. And now a business model for museums. When we did the Spy Museum and all the other museums we were comp contemplating, we said, it's a business. OK, we're not going to lose money on this. We're going to make it for profit. And so we looked at every aspect of our museum. And we saw how it could be revenue generating. And we maximized the return. I know I sound like some guy who's got you know, uh, what do you call it? Selling knives. <laughs> Selling <laughs> knives, right. I sound like Wall Street. Uh, but maximize the return through careful management. And I think that's a critical aspect for all museums. Aggressive marketing. Ah, 
the thing that people fear the most, the fact that you will actually get out there and market, 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 that you will use advertising, that you will, t you will confront the for-profit world and the entertainment world at its own game. And monitoring and adjusting for the visitor. You know, you can build something, you can open something, it doesn't work. Change it. Ask your visitors what they like. Ask the fact that they don't like to hear that the fact that you close at 5. Open, stay open until 7. And finally, trends and outsides conditions. What's happening in your world that will impact the operations of your museum and the success? So the this, this spy museum, what a treat. I remember seeing Dennis uh, faxed me the sort of prospectus for this museum when he was hiring me. And he said, you know, it was all hush hush, as you can imagine. Um, <laughs> and I can't tell you about it. I'll kill you. And so finally, the fax starts coming through at my office. And it says International Spy Museum. And I thought, oh my goodness, this is, this is really, even for a girl, this is as good as it's going <laughs> to get, you know? I love this stuff. So we, we, we had everything lined up. This was the real joy of doing this project. We had a great team. It was a team of rivals. We fought like cats and dogs with different people on the team. Uh, we had excellent people on the team. The graphic designers wanted to do the exhibits. The architects wanted to do the logos. The uh, restaurant designers wanted to do the costumes. I mean, everybody was brilliant, and everybody could do everybody's job better than the person that was doing it. <laughs> but make it clear to say, nobody sat back on their heels on this one, because you knew if you, if you, <laughs> if you didn't even show up for a meeting, boom, your, your scope of work was gone. Um, it, it was a funny thing as we started it. We were told, you know, you can't do this. This won't work. This is a topic that's not worthy. It's goofy. It's going to be Bond. This is going to be a theme park. This is going to be like Disney, blah, blah, blah. Once we got Judge Webster, who had been the only person to serve as head of FBI and head of CIA, once we got him on the board, that kind of went away. Uh, we in the end, ended up with, we, uh, they've had over 5 million visitors so far, over 700,000 a year. If you've been to the museum and you know how small it is, that is an astounding number. It doesn't sound that, that astounding if you're thinking of the Met or even the Rock Hall, but this is teensy. It's been profitable every year, so it made sense to do it as a for-profit. It has approval ratings of 96%. We know because we study it like crazy. We have longitudinal uh, surveys that we do with visitors with gr great regularity to find out, do they like this? Do they not like that? What's the problem? It, are the t-shirts too expensive? Everything. Uh, it was key in the development of downtown, the Penn Quarter, which, you know, I know Dennis worked there uh, at, uh, across the street where the portrait gallery is. And at that point, some years ago, men were escorted to their cars by security. I mean, this was a dicey part of town. It's become the leading place to go for anything spy. If there's an espionage news story, they're there. Uh, all kinds of forums and experts, and it's really been embraced by the international community. It's been imitated by other institutions, and that was great fun for us because all the Smithsonian types were not that um, welcoming, and, and you know we were like a bunch of bozos going in there, and we didn't know what we did. And as soon as we opened, and we started getting the calls to take through the curatorial staff of Air and Space, and blah blah blah, you thought, okay, we're happy to, we're really happy to. <coughs> There's been high interest in such a project. Other people are looking at models. There's actually a copycat project called the uh, Museum of Crime and Punishment around the corner. Uh, and it is. And it's just that, by the way. <laughs> it is. It it's is a, a watered down it version. It is a punishment, let me tell you. And it's a Washington must see to the extent that last weekend the Obama girls went there with their cousins. It was the first museum they went to in Washington. Their choice. Their choice. So, it is rich. Every inch is laden with, uh, uh, with detail. Even when you walk through these environments where, you know, even if you say you don't read, you walk in and you can tell just by looking at each environment that you have completely changed subjects. You could probably get the story without reading a panel. If you don't want to read a panel, there's film and video. If you don't want to read the panels, there's interactives. And even if you look at these slides, uh, your foot, the minute your foot hits the ground, you're on a different surface. You just know when you've walked in that you're in a different place. And people do appreciate the difference. They read it. Um, it, it is high tech. It has, it, it, it has taken advantage of the fact that we know people come to the Spy Museum because they 
love spy thrillers, they read the newspaper, they studied it in history, et cetera. So we, we know they're coming from different expectations and perspectives and we give, give them what they want. And Kathy forgot to mention, because they're also spies. Oh yeah, <laughs> and the see, FBI's out the back. <laughs> yeah, they want to see what we're doing. So there's great film. We did take advantage of the pop culture stuff. Once we heard that, that uh, one of the former uh, directors of CIA had his staff watching um, Mission Impossible. Mission Impossible every week. And after the show was on the next morning, he'd come in and he'd say, can we do it? Do we have it? And they would be ready to say, nope, we don't have it. <laughs> um, and the visitor experience is key. Everything we did there was really about the visitor. The hours are long. They are open every day except Christmas and Thanksgiving mm -hmm. and New Year's. Um, we appreciated greatly that there are very different styles of learning, as I've just mentioned. Uh, one of the things that we did was to make sure that we took people into an insider's point of view, so you give them something they can't get anywhere else. This can be done in almost any kind of museum to get that inside perspective. And there's almost a rhythm and a pacing to where there are artifacts, where there's film and video, where these environments are, and where the texts are. So you don't go a long way with you know, waiting for, for your kind of uh, your sizzle. The text, we get really high rating. We get like 98% on our text. There is not a panel in the museum that is longer than 60 words. And they're big words. And you can stand there without your glasses and a flashlight to read them. <laughs> <laughs> and it, let me tell you, if you think it's easy doing the Rosenberg spy ring in 60 words, it is not. But if you are able to break up stories and tell them sort of consecutively, it, it really makes a difference. And people love it. Um, of course, it, by making it so accessible, it really is immediate, becomes personal to the visitors. If you find layers of things, and it is. It is serious, it is unforgettable, it is thought-provoking. We hope people argue when they walk out of there, just like today, and it is fun. So we can see, you know, their kids, my, my brother took his young twins, they were four years old, to sit down at these interactives, and they said, Aunt Kathy, this is our favorite museum. And I'm like, these kids are four. They're not even supposed to be here. But there's, you know, there is something that is really engaging uh, about the interactives. Um, one more detail. As, as I talked about more is more, we really believe that every square foot in the museum has to sell because every square foot in the museum costs us something to produce, whether it's paint or flooring or speakers. And we follow that throughout. There is something for everyone. And in this case, what was really conscious was age groups and women. Because some of our initial testing said, this is going to be for men, uh, 18 to 35. They're going to come when they come for conferences, blah, 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 blah. And uh, there, there were a number of women on the team that said, you know, that doesn't seem right. If we were in town, we'd go to the spy museum. The truth of the matter is that about 52% of our visitors are women. And we also know that women make the decisions when families are traveling. So we, we went for the women. We got as many female st spy stories in there as possible. And they're the best spies, so that wasn't that hard. And uh, the materials are gorgeous. You, you, I've watched women go through and go like, click, you know, they want to get what was that fabric and what was that flooring. I mean, we, we really paid a lot of attention to it. And then the, the thing that we got to do that was perhaps the most important was every aspect of this, from the web, through the signage, through all these things that are listed here, were done by one team. And we were able to take content that we weren't able to do in exhibits and do it in the restaurant, or do it in products for the store, or do it in our programming. Mm -hmm. And that makes a huge difference. We also followed uh, ADA. I mean, when I was talking about labels and length of them and the size of your, your type, uh, we paid great attention to that. Still, we had a battle. Uh, and there was a lawsuit that is waged for several years on the ADA qualifications at the Spy Museum because they, uh, a suit was made that or was, was brought against the museum that this was not a museum for blind visitors. So even though there's a lot of media and audio, there were not artifacts that, that a blind visitor could handle. So I mean, something for all of us to think of, think, wow, uh, you know, you're not allowed to handle any of the artifacts there. So 
Uh, the st this is the store, designed as a continuation of the museum, listening stands. This is our, um, our cafe, Spy City Cafe. Every detail, even the maps had, ta uh, the tabletops were maps of spy sites in the district. Um, this is the upscale restaurant Zola, which has won a number of awards. Uh, it has these gorgeous red booths with spy holes cut above where people sit so that you can stand right there and see all the way back to a mirror. It's just luscious. It's gorgeous. Uh, the bar is very welcoming. It's a very popular place. Um, you know, it, it's a really comfy, sort of unexpected thing. And this was a, an article, front page of the food section of the Times that appeared about a year after we opened. And this was Zola's ascendancy as a real restaurant the night that Joe Biden, senator at the time, was going in as Michael Jordan, basketball player at the time, was coming out. So this was a place that brought a lot of people It's a together. rare moment for a museum restaurant <laughs> to get a review in the, New York, in the New York Times as I think about it. Um, we did a lot of ads. Do you want to go yeah. here, Dan? Yeah, we can go. As we said before, we, th we think advertising and public relations and marketing are critical, absolutely critical. We had a year-long campaign before we opened, a year-long campaign of PR and then a year-long campaign of advertising, which this was, which appeared in publications for visitors to Washington, in the subways, and wherever. But the idea was to generate word of mouth long before we open. And the next, please. And so we wound up in every publication you can imagine. I mean, when you think about it from Parade Magazine to Traveler to Town and Country, I love the fact, Maxim. I love the <laughs> fact that we're in, in all these things. But there was an angle that we could pursue with all of these, all these papers. And we sought to pursue it. And we weren't ashamed to pursue it. And because what it led to was the staggering business that we achieved. The interesting thing about the Spy Museum, you can talk about it, it has a restaurant, and you can talk about all these other things, which are all amazingly good, I think. But it was DC Business of the Year. How often is a museum a business of the year? And the biz business of the year because it proved its financial success, its community involvement, and it created a buzz in downtown Washington that actually turned that neighborhood around. And then you can see the other awards that we got for Exhibit Design, Best New Museum, Historic Preservation, on down the line. And it's just saying that you can do these things, you can take risks and still have the quality that we hope we all have in our museums. So we're working like flat out to get this done. In uh, It started in January of 2000 and opened in July of 2002. It had no collection. It had no artifacts, no nothing. And we get to the day of opening day, and nobody knew what was going to happen. This is what happened. And the crowds came, and they never left. And this is opening in Washington in July. It's horrible. And it was a really hot July. And you just would, you would go and almost be embarrassed with these lines going around the block uh, for people to get in. So the lines went around the block. You know, it was, it was great fun. We get a little nod from Dave Barry, the humorist, who says, you know, are you insane to go to the spy museum? Uh, there was a line stretching around the block approximately to Ecuador, and that was completely true for about a year until we got the ticketing down so that people wouldn't have to wait in line to get the tickets. They could get them ahead of time. It wasn't like they went away. <laughs> ah. <laughs> and? And, you know, there's a lot of resistance to innovation. And, and for those of you who are in the museum world, you know there's that resistance. There's resistance within your institution. There's resistance outside with your peers. And there's resistance in the organizations <laughs> of, our, of our museum world. And so after a year or two of a May, well, we opened in 2002. So after a year, two years of amazing success, we submitted a proposal to the uh, American Association of Museums annual meeting, celebrating innovation, creating the future. And then we got our rejection letter, I'm sure, you know, which was just <laughs> wonderful. And the topic was too narrow, duplicated ideas, new, no new insights into how to do a museum. And the museum is too new to draw conclusions on sustained success. Um, <laughs> I think they were upset because we had one KGB officer and two, two disguise artists on our panels. I knew that the museum world couldn't handle that. But I make light of it. But it actually was very disappointing for us because we were 
part of what we were doing was an experiment and say, okay, if you don't like the experiment, talk to us about it. Challenge us. You know, and the idea that it was for profit, the idea that you know, it did things in a different way, never got the form that it needed or deserved. So it was a disappointment to us. The heck with them. The heck with them, yeah. Uh, current projects using the model. Uh, since then, we've tried to use the model on a number of projects uh, in terms of aspects of it. And uh, Woodstock, the concert, the museum at the Bethel Center for the Arts. Bethel Center is in upstate New York. Uh, it's the site of the Woodstock concert in 1969. Westlake Reed Laskowski developed the hundreds of acres, including a new concert center. And a museum was put there for the special qualities of the, the, the special history that the, uh, the, the festival in, invokes. And, and what we don't have is an interior shot, but the drama of capturing the festival is really amazingly done within the museum. Uh, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, we're currently working on that, the Oscars Museum. Again, here in, in Hollywood, where they know how to make a buck, uh, the idea, one of the reasons they chose us to work on it was that they don't want to lose a buck. They're investing three to four hundred million dollars in a museum, and even though they have wonderful bookkeeping in Hollywood, uh, the idea is that somehow this museum will be self, it's a nonprofit because it's part of the governor's, uh, uh, part, under the governor's of the academy, but it's going to be self-sustaining. The Great Lakes Science Center, uh, it's interesting, we're working on aspects of that, about rethinking their exhibits as, in a way that interprets science in a new, more storytelling, narrative way. And there's one more, the Western Reserve Historical Society, which we'll talk about in a little later on. And the one we want to talk about is always the most controversial one. Uh, we were asked two years ago, because of the success of SPY, to do the Las Vegas Museum of Organized Crime and Law Enforcement, uh, commonly known as the Mob Museum. So let's talk about the Mob Museum. Doesn't this look like Las Vegas? <laughs> no? Does it look like Cleveland? It looks like John Hay High School. Uh, it was a New Deal building that was, uh, you know, uh, sponsored as a New Deal project. Uh, it's been sitting in old downtown. It has a lot of competition, as you can almost imagine. Uh, and the significant thing about it is that on the second floor of this building in 1950, one were the uh, half-day hearings in, uh, of the Kefauver Senate Committee into organized crime. And uh, that was you know, really a pivotal moment, not only for, uh, for that courtroom, here we are with Kefauver standing in the middle, but also for cities around the country. And what's always fun for us is when we get into a project is to feel how we can drag Cleveland into the project. And it wasn't that hard because when the Cleveland, when the uh, committee hearings came to Cleveland, they spent quite some time here. And uh, the, the shot on the left shows Mickey McBride, who was uh, the owner of a, a taxi, can, uh, taxi company and also it, ha it just so happened owned the race wire uh, linkage for betting across the United States. And he gets hauled before the hearings and he's, he's this guy in the middle. And he did, it turned out he didn't own it. His son, who was a junior at the University of Miami, owned the race wire. So they hauled the kid back in on a subsequent one. That was not Mickey McBride's finest day. This, this one on the lower corner where you see him on the right and Lou Groza in the middle and Paul Brown on the left. That was a much better time for Mickey McBride, who also went on to own the Cleveland Browns. So as we go through with our you know, uh, gathering of information for this museum, Elliot Ness is a natural to any story. And of course, his ashes are, uh, are sprinkled in um, Lakeview Cemetery. So that's a great connection. We also have one of the great Irish um, mobsters, which always makes me happy because I'm Irish. And uh, this is Danny Green. And I think any of us who, who lived here at a certain time were you know, very aware of the level of violence that went on in organized crime activities in Cleveland, um, uh, especially uh, during the 70s and 80s, or sort of culminating in the 70s and 80s. Um, one of the fun things to do on this museum is to try and find artifacts. So we got wind of a sale at Christie's where James Gandolfini, who you can see right there, who played Tony Soprano, was selling 25 of his costumes from the show. And he was selling these as a benefit 
for the Wounded Warrior Project. So all the proceeds from this sale went to uh, helping um, Iraqi Desert Storm, even Vietnam vets who had been seriously uh, injured. It was a great event to be at. We were pretty lucky. We got a couple of outfits at it, and uh, and we got on the front page of the New York Daily News. I mean, you know, you never know. That was kind of fun. Uh, so the collection's off and running. We have secured. Uh, the chair on the right, which was the barber chair that Albert Anastasia was sitting in when he was uh, uh, murdered by his fellow mobsters. The Park Sheraton in New York, there's Albert on the floor. Um, we also looked at, you know, when you're starting a museum like that, you say, what are the iconic artifacts that you must have? We said, we must have something violent we mu that, that really shows the incredible violence because we're not out to glorify the mob in any way, shape, or form on this project. But you can have some fun with a few of the things. Anyway, we said, we need something from The Sopranos. It's one of the most popular TV shows of recent times. Every, a lot of people know the mob through The Sopranos. And how can you not do the Chicago St. Valentine's Day Massacre, which celebrated its 80th anniversary just a couple of weeks ago. So uh, here are the uh, uh, sort of gory images of the aftermath, the newspaper headline, and then a reenactment. Amazingly, we get an email from this woman who just so happens to live in Las Vegas and just so happens to own the wall that her great uncle left to her mother, which is the wall at 2122 North Clark. When the building was torn down, this man bought these bricks in 1967. They've been in storage ever since. So these are being authenticated. He's got all the stuff. And actually, in 1967, I lived in Chicago and remembered when this happened. So uh, this is amazing. This will be one of the icons of the museum. Uh, this building is tough. What are we doing with this building? So now we're battling historic preservation, trying to do anything that, that says mob. We're surrounded by cannons, uh, canyons of neon and uh, green paint. You can sort of see on the edge here. The historic preservationists decided that that one color of apple green trim would really do it for a mob museum. No one knows what they were thinking. Uh, the logo of this museum is interesting. You can see the mob sign up on top. And you can see the document that's kind of redacted. And through the, the redactions on the printed thing, you see an, an image come up. So um, in all FBI records that are redacted, you know, they just read as plain black. There was such ambiguity about the title of the museum that this actually ended up being kind of interesting, because the logo is of mob redacted. <laughs> so that is the logo. It's the brown line that goes through. Uh, and then when anything is, is Xeroxed, it comes out as black and you can't read the redaction. So you know, the good citizens of Las Vegas, who are civic leaders, want a money maker. They want it to revitalize downtown. They know this is the only topic that will do it. And they are very scared. Uh, scared. scared. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dennis, do you want to take it from oh, here? Oh, sure. I always like to go back to the controversy. <laughs> so again, you know, you, you take risks, and we give the city, Las Vegas has taken risks in many ways. But uh, to do a, a museum on the mob was a risk for the mayor. The mayor is the man on the left, Oscar Goodman. And Oscar spent his 34 years of his career as a mob attorney before he became the most popular mayor in Las Vegas history. Uh, he represented Meyer Lansky and Tony the Ant Spilatro and, and many, many, many others. And he really was the one behind this saying, the mob is our history. You know, the mob created Las Vegas and we should celebrate it and treat it as a historical site. So the, so the mayor, who was a very enthusiastic mayor, and actually we could all do with an Oscar, uh, managed to say that this would be a great project for stimulus money from the Obama administration. And if you didn't catch this, folks, it made national news. <laughs> <laughs> and Senator Mitch McConnell from the most corrupt state except for Louisiana, <laughs> Kentucky, uh, of course, denounced it as saying we will not give any uh, mob, you know, money to a mob museum. And of course, Newt chimed in. And so what you see here is, uh, uh, from my perspective, we have several shovel-ready projects. That's what the mayor said. And then uh, Mitch was, we would like on the spending. So this is, excuse me, this is the, what amendment was it again? 
uh, Coburn. Coburn. Yep. Coburn. So this, this sparked all this controversy. And then the amendment comes in in the funding bill, which some of you who are in the museum world are very aware of, that there was to be no money for museums in the stimulus package. And this was directly in relation to our project in Las Vegas, uh, that we would like on the spending side, obviously, to avoid funding things like a mob museum or water slides. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get it. They also had in that bill saunas. And it I don't zooms. know. I, I wasn't quite sure. Oh, and pastel lighting. I wasn't quite sure what that meant. <laughs> I think these senators have much, too much time on their hands. And this is a quote from, uh, from uh, Newt. Uh, not from, from Newt? Yeah. Oh, sorry. I thought it was from Black. Anyway, I think if the mom wants a museum, they have enough money to build it themselves. <laughs> well, it has sparked controversy, but. You know, the interesting thing about this museum is that it's actually going to be like Spy and like Rock and like some of the others, a very serious and very powerful museum. Because through the history of the mob, and you can trace the history of America in the 20th century and into the 21st century. And if you don't think that's true, start to read and start to read about who are the characters. From Joe Kennedy to John Kennedy to Richard Nixon, to some of the biggest financiers, to Howard Hughes. I mean, the, the life of the mob and how it's penetrated our society is an amazing, rich, complex, and entertaining, yes, story, and scary in places. We would make the argument, too, that perhaps now more than ever, people really do need to know the consequences of organized crime. For example, uh, within a couple of months after 9-11, over $63 million was awarded uh, to contracts uh, in contracts at the Ground Zero site that went to the Lucchese, Gambino, Colombo and DeCavalcanti families. So if you are an, uh, an assiduous reader of the New York Times and looking for these topics, there's about a story a week on crane operators with ties to one of those families or window scams in the Catholic schools or whatever. So it is not gone. Madoff uh, experts believe that mo a significant amount of that money came in from uh, money that was being laundered either by the Russian mob or by uh, Colombian and Mexican drug cartels. So where does all this money go? It has to get laundered somewhere. And then my favorite, the trash situation in Naples, where it got up to the second and third stories of buildings and it killed the buffalo mozzarella uh, industry in that part of Italy. These are stories that are with us, as are stories that are on the front pages of our papers and every and papers all across America about corruption, about infiltration of legitimate businesses and the like. So, you know, we're on a slippery slope, and the more people sort of had a light shown on this, we say the better. <laughs> so the idea with mob, and then we'll get off the mob and go on to a few other things, is that again. The idea with the Mob Museum is to tell a provocative story, to tell it in all the ways that Kathy suggested, immersive, uh, uh, deal with the multi-layers of learning that people bring to this, whether they only want to watch films, or they read a label, or they want to look at pictures, or they want to do an interactive. But to be sensitive to all those things, to give a smart experience and a real and authentic story that has some meaning to their lives after they walk out of Mob, and yet at the same time, they can buy a Tony Soprano t-shirt. <laughs> and cement boots. So we want to move out of the trenches here and do that by really stopping to back up and say uh, these are projects that, that we have done or are doing. They're, they're based in many ways on some of our favorite places. We admire so many of the museums and institutions uh, across the country. We, of course, you look to the Met, you look at this great new ad campaign the Met's doing where they're, what are they doing, flickers and uh, uh, very immediate ads from the galleries that are saying, you know, here's a shot of my parents kissing in front of the kiss, the kiss or something, really saying to people, this is your place, come in, enjoy it. Uh, we love that actually that the Met was one of the proponents of the blockbuster that, that really got people that may not have been aware of, uh, of art as such a powerful uh, tool into the museums. They built really nice restaurants. They did high-end souvenirs in big stores. Uh, and 
uh, many of these ideas are ones that, that the Met or the Art Institute or the Cleveland Museum of Art had a real role in promoting. We admire the Detroit Art Institute, uh, thinking about the representing of the work in their collection. Even the Brooklyn Museum, where they don't always get it right, but they're trying. So the, the, the element of experimentation is not a bad thing. Yeah, and, and just on, on both, since uh, we have close ties to both of those institutions, those are institutions battling for their lives. Uh, the Detroit Institute of Arts. I mean, I worked there for many years in Brooklyn. Uh, has been challenged for years, and you just think these are battling for their lives, and so they, they are the, the sources of controversy. They do things in a different way, but they could close tomorrow, and, that's not, uh, and that would be a great loss to all of us. Here you go. Oh, that's my line mm -hmm. here. Yep. Uh, oh, and then we love the things around us. We look at how the institutions in our own city are taking risks. I mean, risk is interesting to us, and to see that, uh, for example, Natural History has embarked on a project to get its collections, its marvelous collections out of storage, which most of us don't have a chance to see. They're just incredible. The Western Reserve Historical Society is rethinking itself and, and about the importance of a core collection and how to introduce Clevelanders and visitors to the idea of what this city is all about so that there's a place where you can get the basics before you go on to the more esoteric issues. The Great Lakes Science Center, again, taking risks about how to reinterpret science for a more general audience, not just children, as many science centers do. And the Cleveland Museum of Art, which um, ta is taking the risk with how it's going to do its lifelong learning and its teaching approach to its fabulous collections. So these risks are interesting to us. And we know that not all of them are going to work. Not all the things that we've done have worked. But they are important to take that, to take that challenge. <laughs> Victory! <laughs> So, the yeah, conclusion. Sure our, our, here's our bottom line. Uh, it's a new world. It has been for quite a while. There are a lot of people, and many of you, many of those people are in this room today, uh, working hard to rethink the museum, to, to not overthink the museum, but to act on what the museum can be today. Uh, today, museums are much more sophisticated, much more complex, much more competitive. Um, Wealthy institutions that have done nothing wrong have seen flush endowments just crash. And, and their levels of, of uh, uh, giving really been, been greatly curtailed. And I think it provides a very interesting opportunity for all of us to see what these institutions do to, uh, to uh, cut costs, to you know, think smart, think fast, turn on a dime, and stay true to their mission, but try other things. So it's, it's a great time for that. And we say all the more reason to experiment, to borrow, ideas from anywhere you can Steel get them. Ideas Steel tomorrow. ideas. Steal ideas. Uh, copy is, or imitation is, the, is a true form of flattery. And with all the new media uh, opportunities and all the non-traditional ventures that are going on, even looking at the for-profit museum, for example, might be a smart thing to do. And so we end with, if you are successful, you will have queues all the way to Ecuador. <laughs> so that is our, uh, our view of new museums and new ideas. And we'd be delighted to take any questions. And we'd be del delighted to argue about any of the top 10. That's why we put them in there. <laughs> so. Thank you. Thank you. What do you think is the light time expectancy of an exhibit that's such a spy. I mean, how long will it last as it is and then need to be redone? Uh, that's a good question, Marcy. It's, um, it needs I, to be redone. Yeah, it needs <laughs> to be redone. It's, um, spy is now seven years old. Uh, a lot of the topics were um, just, uh, a lot of them are very historical, OK? They go back to spying in the ages of the Romans or whatever, OK? But a lot of them are more contemporary than that and deal with the issues of the Middle East and terrorism and so forth. And they do need an update. And the interesting thing about the, what saves SPY uh, is that it's in a city in which the turnover of visitors is remarkable. Washington gets 22 million visitors or more a year. You know, the seventh grade class trip, the blah, blah, blah. And so there's a new pool of visitors every year. And so unlike, say, the Cleveland or Detroit or Pittsburgh or whatever, that, that they don't share that turnover. So we, it's been able to kind of not do much change. But it, so I would say they should do it every 
you could afford to do it every seven years, five to seven? I think a lot of it is still relevant. Yeah. Uh, what, what you notice is that you've got to start going in and uh, redoing some things just from wear and tear. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I mean, that's what I was thinking yeah. of more. It, it, because there's enough, as Dennis said, new visitors that, and there's so much in there that you could go in maybe four or five times without seeing the same thing. You yeah. keep seeing different layers of it. We're just sick of it. But my question also Good. really, uh, what I wanted to address was really the technology mm. becoming, yes. people were used to it, therefore to be cutting edge, you yeah. change it. Well, that's a great example. The Rock Hall is an excellent example. Yeah. I, I mean, maybe I glossed over that or I didn't have the impact. When we did the Rock Hall, the technology we did for the Rock Hall was be, by far the cutting edge in 1993 because that's when we created the exhibits. We opened in 95, but the exhibits were being created in 93, 94. And so, yes, now on your iPod, you can get more songs than we could have ever done. And uh, so they, by the way, are revisiting their technology and plan to revamp the technology, not so much the content, but the technology of, pres of their presentation. I would argue also, though, because I'm a great believer in content and story, that you've got to revamp your content, too, if, if and when you can. You know, there's new interpretation, there's new ideas, there's new approaches to things. And so, you know, what, I'll go back to the Rock Hall, what punk rock was in 1993 is not what it is in 2009. And it's the same, you know, it's, so you've got to look at this thing and there's got to be a freshness to it. So, but not, you sometimes don't have the ability to do just that. Uh, way in the back, I think. Was not always organized crime and law enforcement before the second half had to be added? <laughs> oh, that's such a good question. How perceptive <laughs> back then. <laughs> It, it was on the one hand, but, but the truth of the matter is that if you just tell the story of the mob, it gets really old after a while. It gets interesting when there's conflict, and the conflict is law enforcement trying to get them. And uh, law enforcement tools, maybe not in Mexico, but here have gotten pretty good at, at, you know, at, breaking, mm -hmm. these, um, at breaking up these families and these syndicates. How, uh, the woman who, who is the chairman of the board is the former special agent in charge of the Las Vegas office of the FBI. So we've got those people in. They have really informed it. You know, the mayor was a mob attorney, uh, and that kind of uh, 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 is really interesting. Um, There's some great fights. The, the title, though, was the Las Vegas Museum of Organized Crime and Law Enforcement, which is two letters short of the longest museum title we could possibly find. And you know, and you knew everybody was going to call it mob. So it, it's taken some real work with the board to understand that we're, you know, doing a serious museum and you can do it and uh, and still kind of have some fun with it. And and just to finish the thought, I mean, it's interesting about Las Vegas or any city about how much risk any community is willing to. This is a City of Las Vegas project. It is funded by City Monday. It has a community board of people like Kathy just suggested, very well-known Las Vegans who see this project as a way of revitalizing their very uh, troubled downtown. And, um, and they have their qualms. You know, some want to forget about the fact that, uh, you know, Mo Dalitz and Lucky Luciano and Meyer Lansky were their founding fathers. You know, and, uh, and others think, hey, it's our story. You know, so it's... He was it's, such a nice man. Yeah. <laughs> Why did Milton Maltz have the idea of the spying museum? Milt, Milt and I worked together. Let's, let's go back a little history. Milt was on the board of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame when I was director. And when I left, uh, I went to work, not immediately, but shortly thereafter for Milt. And we sat, a group of us sat, when I was talking, we had about 12 ideas for museums. Spy was one of them. But there were multiple other concepts that we tested internally and with others and with um, market testing. And Spy was one of them. And there were two previous projects that failed to happen because of real estate issues in different cities. They were totally different topics. Just totally work. But we thought that spy was a good topic. And you got and that came from working on the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame Museum. It, it came from 
sort of, in the sense that when we did rock, which I, I, still, I, I still love, and I think it's great for the city, there were certain things we wanted to do, but we couldn't do uh, because of the limits of, A, getting a building like that done in a highly politically charged atmosphere with a board that had 800,000 people on it, half of them from New York, half of them from Cleveland, the rest from Mars. And uh, I mean, it was, it, it was challenging. And so some of the ideas that we saw that could work at Rock, we knew we couldn't do in that atmosphere. And so Milt and others and I thought, oh, we can, if we have our, if we are the masters of our own destiny, we can try doing these ideas. Right there. Uh, yes, it, by having museums uh, for things like uh, rock and roll and crime and espionage, uh, don't you, you leave yourself open to the charge that, that you're uh, dwelling a, a, upon the, the negative side of, a, a, of, of the human experience. So, so that rather than, than having, as, as in a traditional museum, uh, museums that are, that, that are open to the public and expose people to positive influences, you, you have museums that are, are only available to those who can afford it to expose them to negative influences. Well, we'd argue with the negative aspect. Yeah, we would really argue. With right that. out of the bat, in in and I think, mob is trickier, <laughs> but you do have law enforcement fighting the mob, and and valiantly and smartly, and that's that's you know beat cops. Those are DAs and federal federal prosecutors and jurors and witnesses and the whole shebang of of honest citizens who want to curtail mob activity, who are willing to put their lives on the line and do. In spy, there is an aspect of spying that is so necessary to any country's national interest. And there was nothing that could have impressed that upon us more than the fact that we were working in downtown Washington on September 11th of 2001. And the whole town closed down. It was, um, and the topic that we were working on that day was Pearl Harbor. And the thing that was in front of us on the desks the, the, the topic was Pearl Harbor, greatest intelligence failure. And as the day went on, you thought, no, nope, this is not the greatest intelligence failure, Pearl Harbor. Today is the greatest intelligence failure. And I think the point, it, it became a real mission for everybody working on that museum by the time that was over. Most spying is done for good purposes to get people, get countries information that they need to have. So we yeah. disagree with that right off the bat. And I think the numbers kind of, prove that, the people don't go to hear, to see bad stuff. I mean, they might go, crime and punishment, they their numbers are terrible. <laughs> so. And rock and roll, don't get me started. <laughs> I love rock and roll. And I think it's really critical to our history and critical to music development. And it has every right to have a museum just like classical music. So how can you possibly say what you just did? <laughs> End of story. Have you ever been in a band? <laughs> been in the where? We don't have enough talent. <laughs> no. Do you yeah, know yeah. what they have to do? Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Groupies are terrible. I wanted to ask you a question about storytelling. Yeah. Because I think we, you know, your idea, the museum is a place of storytelling, and, I think, and I'm so convinced by that. But then I was thinking about the group process. You know how you go to a dinner party and you love it when somebody tells their story? That's one voice. How do you, what's your process like to create a story when you've got multiple people around the table, you've got a board, you've got people mm -hmm. with different ideas. How do you shape your story? Well, you try and go for the best story, <laughs> you know, that has the most aspects to it, that, that has a surprise to it. And do you function as gatekeepers? Like how, the process side of it too, I mean, sorry. Yeah, we do. And so like for mob, it's funny now, you know, there, there are a lot of books on the mob, so we read everything we can get on the mob. And you're, you're always going for like, eh, you know, Lucky Luciano, everybody knows that or knows that. So you're looking for some weird thing that's a connection, that's a story that maybe nobody's heard that would really surprise somebody, that some unlikely person got caught up in this whole thing and how that went. And then part of what happens as you move through is, is there an artifact? Is there even a possibility mm -hmm. of an artifact? Or that would be lovely. Is there even a photograph? Mm -hmm. So, you know, for us to have a chance to work with, oh, organizations like the Western Reserve Historical Society, they got what they have as artifacts. And there are great stories behind them. But when you're going from the other direction, it, it, it's like a lot of things inform, form you. 
I think what you get, especially, and, and when you're talking with some things that are relatively current history, okay, even if you go back to the Cold War, and Kathy briefly mentioned the Rosenbergs, uh, but you get a lot of opinions, okay, when you're around the table, and then you get the various proofs about who did what to whom, and some of them are shocking, okay? I mean, you, be, you get deeper and deeper into these storylines. Uh, and um, so, but there, there are different opinions. How, you know, should we talk, first of all, should we talk about it? Then how yeah. are we gonna talk about it? Then whose story are we gonna use? And then, indeed, with most stories, the evidence does come out, and you go for the story that really has the evidence, and then a way you can express that story. There are great stories you can't even figure out how to tell. You know, I mean, it's, it's uh, I, and then you, there's a, there can be a repetition and a boredom with, you know, you also, th you also think about how are you gonna tell something? Uh, I'll go, I'm gonna go to Spy, because I love, I love and hate a, uh, an exhibit that we did. And it was about the stealing of atomic secrets, okay? Probably the biggest theft, the biggest spy story, the biggest theft of information in the, in the history, certainly in the 20th century. And he said, how do you tell that? Again, it's very controversial. And we came up with a brilliant way to tell it. And I won't go through the story. But it's six minutes long to tell this story. And you always want people to stand there for the payoff, which is the bomb goes off. And people get bored through the first three minutes. You go, you want to pull them back and go, wait, wait, wait. It gets really good. <laughs> and um, so you have, fa you have failures. You have to think about, you know, we wanted to tell the story, but there was no easy way to tell it. You know, you fall in love with stories, too. I mean, you do. And uh, yeah. you do. Fair so enough. it's like, we're going to tell this story. It's a last Some hell thing high I water. do. <laughs> and one, of, one interesting one, there was somebody, uh, a daughter of a mobster from Cleveland called and said, um, well, I, would, I know you're doing this museum, and I expect you're doing my father. And if you are, I would want to make sure that he's treated with respect, and I've got this stuff, and I think it should be out there. You know, so you like you start falling in love with that story because here's this young woman, who, you know, her dad was like past prime when she was born, and she's kind of searching for you. She's trying to find out as much as you know and how you, you know, it's it's, it's very interesting, how that evolves. She Alan? did admit her dad was a bootlegger, though. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that illegal stuff. <laughs> that illegal stuff. Let's take one over okay. there, then one over there. One, Ellen, first, and then we'll get this. Um, would you advocate the art museums to uh, adopt some of these tactics and strategies that you're supposed to I mean, a lot of museums that are in public are, are, are art museums. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that the story um, is not as obvious or compelling or, uh, or Bound or whatever. It's one of the ways that our museums in, in recent years have gotten a lot of people to come um, is to have events, parties, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, so on, uh, and or like the Guggenheim did have the motorcycles. Although I tend to doubt that anybody, the large number, I would say anybody, but a large number of people who came to see the motorcycles would come back again to see um, our model dresses. <laughs> you know, you know, to see all. So, um, a, and a lot of the museums that you mentioned that are, that are sort of in the toilet at the moment are, mm -hmm. are, are, are art museums. Would you advocate that art museums start doing all this interactive stuff? Who wants to take it? I'm happy to start. I'm happy to start. Go. Go. I, the answer is, uh, I, I, you know, Ellen, I don't think any museum can do all these things, okay, successfully. I mean, it's, it's a, you know, we, we have the chance to experiment a little bit with tight little topics. But I think you're right. I think art museums do have to rethink themselves to a great degree. I mean, we love them. They're our first great love. And there are a lot of people in this room say, you know, the object itself will speak to you, that painting will speak to you, and that's enough. But we know that in our society, it's no longer enough. It just isn't. And because uh, the society is moving on. So I think some of these things have to be adopted. Now, whether you have to put every painting or sculpture in the context of 18th century France, I'm not sure. I think you can do some of that and make it more valid. I don't think you have to recreate an 18th century French room, but, you, but I think more information done in an interesting way does help. Uh, on the, and Kathy will probably have more to say about that. I just want to say on the operational end, yes. I, th I just think we're killing ourselves. I mean, we, we, create, we create places that can't function you know, in terms of the economy. 
and some of them are just so big and so large and in the wrong place, like Brooklyn, that you don't know what they're going to do. Okay? And then you think, well, where, where do you get the management in there? And you can learn. We had Disney in there. You can learn from Disney. You can learn from how they treat guests. You can learn from what their attitudes are with their staff. You can learn about, you know, our operations person in, at Spy was from Disney. And he was really good. And you know what? That's why it makes 20% profit every year. I, I don't suggest art museums can, but you'd hate to see them being the sieves that they are. So I keep thinking it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real challenge, but I think some of these things can be instituted. And yet we don't want to turn the art museum into the spy museum. Well, maybe. <laughs> you had a, Do you have a question? Yeah, I have two questions, just show one. Uh, you introduced yourself uh, that you uh, uh, introduce yourself more uh, be concerned on issues of practical instead of philosophical items you want to pursue in this lecture. Can a museum like yours or any museum can it, can it afford to have no philosophy? Oh, I wouldn't say it doesn't have a philosophy oh, yeah. at, at all. It has a mission. It has uh, guiding principles that guide everything you do. Uh, we're, I'm just saying we are not people that normally get up at AAM conferences and give long papers where we've delved into it. But mm -hmm. uh, no, there's an absolute philosophy. There, there's almost a, a set of, of checks and balances on anything you do. Does it fit within the mission of what you're trying to do? And, mm -hmm. and we developed that and really uh, stuck to it. Uh, mission drift was one of the big um, fears because you could go all over the place with this thing and I don't feel we went anywhere yeah. uh, off of introducing a topic that is important around the world throughout time. It's sometimes because of its very nature it's explained through pop culture because that's often the only way anybody could get information about it. So that was very bona fide to do. It's the same thing for the mob. Uh, pop culture also in many ways informs very much of it, not to it in a derogatory way. Yeah. Yeah, sort of address this a little bit. Um, you can actually any topic could be a guest by a museum if it was handled well. Um, or does it need to be back on the popular culture? Say the, 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 the last part. Does it need to be back on the popular culture in some way? I think, you know, there, there's something. I was on the AAM website, and there was a question. Uh, how do I start a museum? And when I saw that that was a topic where you could go into the website and get all this information, it's like I just shuddered. <laughs> it was like the worst news. <laughs> uh, because, you know, people have really interesting ideas that might be an exhibit, might be a book, might be mm -hmm. a website, might be a lecture, but doesn't really have to be a museum. But I think people have such a love of museums that actually I found one yesterday. It was the Museum of Failures. <laughs> it's like, let's talk about failures. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, it, it hasn't been built yet, <laughs> uh, but it was about engineering failures. Uh, it, you know, the people could learn from mistakes and failures. I, I don't think there could be a museum about, uh, unless there was a very wealthy donor, there cannot be a museum about every topic because there isn't, you know, sort of enough of a demand. There's so, and there was one in the paper the other day about um, all the, the churches in the Diocese of Cleveland that are going to be closed. And so somebody had written a letter and said, every one of those should be turned into a neighborhood museum. And you're just like, oh, you know, there isn't enough money to pay the heating or, you know, probably secure the locks on all those buildings uh, if they were treated that way. But does it only have to be pop culture? No. No. No, I for, think they're very serious yeah. topics that can be, you know, wonderfully done. Should we close on the note of you love the museum? Is there another question? We'll give you one more chance. <laughs> it's about Guggenheim. Mm -hmm. Guggenheim, Dresden, uh, Deutsche Bank in Berlin. Do they not give us very good examples? And uh, the quotation you have had, every square foot sells because every square foot costs. And in the sense of Guggenheim Museum, I would rather say every square foot counts because every square foot imports. So there might be a change how to get uh, the community, the audience, into the museum and uh, interest even waking up interest for very traditional yeah. uh, topics. And you know what? I would like to hear your opinions about uh, this model of. You know what? In the in an earlier talk, 
um, where we use some of this. Um, <coughs> I, I, talk, I did talk about the Guggenheim as an example of something that you can all have your opinions, but I think got it very, very right, okay, in, in Bilbao. The, the incredibleness of the transformative nature of the architecture that just made it a draw within itself. And then, you know, um, and I think that that was a really powerful, smart statement. I don't think all the Guggenheims everywhere do just what you're talking about. In fact, I'm not sure most of them do. But I thought that one was a brilliant, um, a brilliant move to use that architect, to use it at a city that needed transformation, that to, to get a community behind it. It was transformative for the community, it was we all know. And so, yeah, I think you can do that. I, I, we had a one thing, we had one slide up there saying, build it, they will come. I don't think that's necessarily true. And I think there are examples of great architecture and or significant architects and design that are great failures in terms of their impact as the years go by on the community. And uh, you can say they're a great architectural statement. And I look at the Calatrava in Milwaukee, where it had incredible attendance and is now barely surviving. OK, so you know what? There, there's no simple answer here. I do think architecture and great design and great materials and materials in terms of what you're presenting have great significance, but getting that combination right is very hard. It's going to be hard for all the projects around us. Well, should we close on the note of the transformative museum, but it's a difficult, a difficult task facing. We are also interested in what you think, so if you have time, please fill these out. We'll collect them on the door. On the, will you, but you would, Will you please join me in thanking our speakers for a really